I live for Sunday morning. I live for Sunday morning. I live to see your faces. I live to be able to see y'all coming in the building and some of you wearing masks, some of you not. Like, it doesn't matter. Just glad you're here. Um, glad you're here. Glad you're doing your part to uh, love your part of the world. Um, glad you're doing your part to, um, to keep things safe around you and all that kind of stuff. But I love to see on Facebook and everything that life is still going on. Like, that is the beauty of this whole thing is that you're still doing vacations, you're still doing stuff with your families, and you're not just hunkered down and living in fear. Let's don't live in fear. Live by faith. When we live by faith, fear sits down, right? Amen? Amen. All right, so in the middle of the series called Off the Table, the non-negotiables of our faith, and we've hit several of them, we, we've kind of hit the big hitters, and so um, I've said it before that we line up with the Baptist faith and message, and so um, and some of you are like, man, I didn't know we were a Baptist church, and so um, it's not in our name necessarily, but for all of the years, 15 years of being a student pastor here, it was First Baptist Church of Euless, and so now it's Cross City Church. And so Baptist isn't the thing that we, uh, that we put out there and let everybody chew on that and, and uh, come or not come or whatever, but truly to the core of who we are, we line up with a lot of the Baptist stuff that's out there. And we'll talk through that today because we're talking about the church. And, and my hope is to get you to a place where you believe wholeheartedly that the church and you being a part of the church, the local body, yes, the universal, I'm a believer, I believe in Jesus Christ, the church universal, awesome, but also this local congregation, this community that we have. And I've got to say, the reason that I love being here on Sunday mornings is because when I walk in that door, and I already see Keith Emery, and he's already putting signs out, is that he believes in it, and he loves it, and he's willing to be here early enough to, to go in to set that stuff up. Why? Just to get people inside the room. Why? So they can worship. Why? So they can, they can learn. Why? So they can have community and fellowship. And those are all great things that happen inside the church. Those are things that happen inside of here or inside of the other churches that are around us should be happening on a grand level, um, and, and it should be something that we want to be a part of. So kiddos, if you're here today, there is a sheet, a fill-in sheet, and there is a smorgasbord of great candy, all right? And so if you'll fill in the sheet, if you'll listen, pay attention, if you don't know how to spell a word, um, maybe ask mom or dad to help you in that, or if you don't think they know the answer, whoever's sitting on the other side of you, all right? But so glad y'all are here. And so as we talk through this stuff today, the things that, uh, when you look at it, the things that are on the table, those are the things that we can, we can discuss them. Those are the things that we can uh, hash out. Those are the things that we may change our opinion on. Those are things that we may need to do more study on to make for sure that we have the right answer. And really, truly, man, we talked about the Bible. The Bible should be our extreme right answer for the things and the questions that come up in our life. But... But once we get those things and they're solidified, then those things aren't on the table anymore. These are the things, man, man we, we hold them tightly in our fists and we say, these are the things that I will hold tightly to. These are the things that I will, I will fight you over because they matter the most. They're the things that we should be able to look at our neighbors and look at our family members and look at the stuff that the media puts out there and to be able to combat because these are the solid rock foundational things about our faith. And so um, the, the open fist versus the closed fist, these may be the things that we can, we can talk all day about this. And one of the things that Michael and I go back and forth on is, is even, uh, and we always line up together, but other people may not view it, but just worship styles and things like that. Worship styles should never have divided a church. It's a style, right? Uh, and you may not be that that's your favorite style, but man, who can't get behind lyrics like the ones that we sang today? Who can't get behind some of the older hymns that were written years and years and years ago? Those shouldn't be things that split us, but more times than not, our personal preference at times are the things that cause friction inside the church. And so I pray that we would never be those people that would cause friction and so we've said it from the get-go, is that the problem, here's a great quote, the problem from a human, not God perspective uh, with gray areas is that they often end up being the things which Christians disagree about the most. And then what typically happens 
my little scenario about First Baptist Murfreesboro, Second Baptist Murfreesboro, Third Baptist Murfreesboro is that they tend to split churches. Man, church should be the thing that glues a community together and doesn't show the community that we can't get our mess together and agree on things and do life and do church and do Jesus well. I just want us to do Jesus well. If we can do Jesus well inside of here, you and I will always see eye to eye, we'll always be great, we'll love each other. But if we can't even at times uh, talk about things and, and, and even disagree in an amiable manner, man, that's a sad state of affairs. So last week, Last week when we were talking through this, uh, we made this very bold statement that man was created in the image of God. He was created uh, in the very image of God. He was sitting there in all of this beautiful creation. It was perfect and still sinned. And so, man, like in the world that we live in today, so we know now why sin exists. If it can exist and come out of a perfect situation, then in our messed up situation, then we know sin is going to thrive in that. But we also said the only fix for man's sin problem is the sovereignty of God and his gift, the free gift of salvation. That's where we landed last week. And you and I, we've got to realize that man is not born good. Man is literally born bad. We talked about these two words put together, totally depraved, left on our own. We're going to pick the wrong thing to do nine out of ten times. Jesus comes in. Jesus is the one that can fix us inside of all of that, and he does that through Jesus. And then we went through the Roman road, and here's where we come to that place that we understand that everybody sinned. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we pulled out our bow, and we went to shoot, and, and we tried to do life, and then when we missed the mark that God had for us, that was sin. Whatever, wherever that landed, that was sin. So then we pull out another bow, and then we try to hit the target. And then when we miss that again, what God wanted us to do, there's the target, there's the bullseye. When we missed any other spot of it, that was sin. And when we sin, man, the Bible says that we all do it, and we all fall short of the glory of God. Maybe the glory of God was right here, and we just missed it. That's sin. And the only fix for that is Jesus. And then 623 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through who? Your own merit, you being good enough, you smiling every time you go to work, and you showing up to church 52 Sundays out. No, all of that is from the free gift of Jesus Christ. Man, it's a beautiful thing. I think, I don't know if you were able to put that, gra- uh, that thing back in, Michael, this week, but you did so good in, in just pointing that picture. Wage of sin, death, way, uh, gift, God, eternal life. Like, it's just a beautiful picture, and the only way we get from one side of that to the other is through Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. Literally, that's the bridge illustration. The cross becomes the bridge. It's the only way man gets from here to God is through Jesus Christ. And then 5.8, Romans 5.8, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, while we were still messed up, he died for us. Jesus Christ died for us. So today, if you would like to read, it's a longer passage today, but a beautiful picture about the church. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 36, you've got your Bibles, out. Awesome. If you've got your phone, you can turn uh, in there and, uh, and find our, our stuff as far as all of our notes. But let's stand in honor of reading scripture. Acts chapter 2 verse 36 says this. Therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this. This is a great oratory moment in the Bible. This is the beginning of the new uh, early church. And so these are words that are said to a very, uh, very thick crowd of people who are trying to figure out what are these apostles doing, right? And so here's what happens. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Messiah. Man, Messiah is one of those words that they're sitting there going, whoa, you're saying this is the Messiah, Very bold statement. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And anytime you go to a place and you hear these words that cut to your heart, then the next answer is, then what do we do with this, right? And so here's all these people asking that question. Here's what Peter replied. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise, this promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all who the Lord our God will call. Verse 40, with many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. 41, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 
were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. 44, all the believers were together. What? All of the believers. That word all, you know what it means? All. All of the believers were together and they had everything in common. Here's the next crazy thing. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone. Some of you are like, is he going to ask us this? No. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. And last verse, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I would love to see that happen again in our time. Would you? Three of us in here. Let's pray. God, I pray that that, that, that set of verses, that it would challenge us, that it would compel us, that it would encourage us to be you with skin on so much in this crazy, messed up world, that we would be bold enough to stand and say to people, hey, I know it's rough right now, but Jesus is the one that fixes that. And that we would compel them, that we would beg them, that we would plead with them to come and be a part of something that's bigger than themselves. And that we would tell our stories of, of our salvation because of who Jesus is. And that what you would begin to do inside of Cross City North, that, that really and truly there wouldn't be a building anywhere in Trophy Club or Roanoke that would contain what you we're doing inside the hearts, lives, and minds of your people. So would you spur us on to love and good deeds that would encourage others to follow our lead in leading people to you, Jesus. If it doesn't get them to you, then what we're doing here doesn't need to continue. But if what we are doing here is good and right and pleasing in your eyes, would you encourage us to be you, Jesus, with skin on? to be your visual representation while we are here on this plan. Help us to do a better job of that tomorrow than we did today. Help us to do a better job of that next week than we do this whole week. Help us to grow each and every day to be the church that you want us to be. Jesus, it's in your name that we pray it all. And everybody said... Amen, amen, amen. I got the chance this, uh, this past week to teach one of our senior adult classes on a Zoom. And it was so encouraging to be able to teach one of uh, Ulysses, Cross City, uh, Cross City uh, the Ulysses campus, to teach one of the senior adult classes via the Zoom. And to hear uh, all of these senior adults who made their way onto Zoom, uh, got on the computer, right? And that, that was probably a feat for a lot of them. And then to, to be able to navigate and to talk to each little person in the square and everything. But what I saw in that and what I was so encouraged is that the church still wanted to be the church, even inside of the pandemic. Like they were still wanting community. They were still wanting connection. They were still wanting fellowship. They were still wanting to laugh together, and yet they were also still wanting to learn scripture together. They were still wanting to be encouraged by the word. And so no matter how crazy things gets, they, they get out there, no matter how many news stations you watch every day, I challenge you to quit watching the news. It's good. <laughs> Mama K. Hey, if we, can't, if we can't learn it from Mama K, right, to, to, to quit watching these, like, here's the deal. Some of you are wondering, oh, I wonder how many more people died today. Like, is that really how you want to start your day? Like, I really want to know, are we going to start school? Are we going to? You're going to find out. But more times than not, if you just sit there and you watch the news or you hang out and you wonder, man, is this next reporter, are they really going to, uh, are we going to find the cure today or tomorrow? It's not going to happen today or tomorrow. It'll happen. It's happened in every other flu, every other pandemic that's come around. Like, we've been able to do it. We still don't have a cure for cancer. People are still passing away with it. So why is it that we put so much stock in what the news has to say and way less in what Scripture has to say? It's either amen or oh me because more times than not, we would rather hang out in the so-called truth of what uh, MSNBC says or what Fox says more so than what God's Word says. I'm not telling you to quit watching the news. I'm just saying if you're one of those people and all you do is worry, 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 you're... you're the worst person to watch the news. That's my nice way of saying it. Hey, don't be dumb, right? Like, if you know this is going to drag you down, don't get drugged down by this. 
So, Merry Christmas. There's the little side note. Number one, if you're, what, if you're filling in points or whatever today, this is for the adults in the room. Evangelism is sharing the gospel. And it's exactly what Peter and the apostles are doing in this moment. But it's sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus with unbelievers. Some of us are great at sharing the good news with other believers. Like we will get in a church setting and we will talk about Jesus until the cows come home, until the food is on the table. Like we will talk to other believers. But you ask us to be in a situation or a setting to talk to unbelievers? Zoop. Why? Believers don't need the hope. They already have it. Believers don't need the life change. Their life's already been turned, Right? But those people that are in our lives that you sit there and you watch them each and every day and you wonder, man, I wonder, is this person a believer? Do they go to church? Do they have a relationship with the Lord? Those are the people that need it. And so it's what started the first church and it's the answer to the question that that was asked there. What shall we do? When these people who were there who were not believing in Jesus, it says that they were cut to the heart and their first question is what's next? And so that's why we do a next step class for people. And some of you, maybe you came to my house when we did a next step class. Maybe you came to Byron Nelson when we did a next step class. And I just said, hey, I'm just going to turn service into a next step class and begin to answer some of those things and to say, hey, these are things that are off the table. We, we don't debate them. This is who we are. And if you love who we are and you want to jump in with us, awesome. If you can't believe in any of the things that we talked about in the last five weeks, find a place somewhere else. I love you. I mean it. But these are the things. I'm never going to debate you about the Trinity. I'm never going to debate you about these things, the Bible, the church. I'm not going to debate those and hope that maybe, just maybe, I'll change your mind or your, your, your thought process on it. But if you believe in that, if you're on board with that, come on. I would love for you to continue to help us fight the good fight, right? So look at it right here in verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. Have you ever been in a conversation with somebody and then all of a sudden they were just, like you could just tell they were automatically dealing with maybe a sin, something that they were struggling with, and then they just started confessing it to you like you were the Pope. And then all of a sudden, man, they they just begin to go in a whole laundry list of some things that they know are not right in their life. Like it's happened time and time again in student ministry where all of a sudden a student was dealing with this, and then, man, we are 10 points into some of the biggest struggles of their life. That's the Holy Spirit. When you get inside of those moments, man, thank God for it, but then also be ready to help share with somebody, where do we go next with that? But brothers, what shall we do? So they're asking the apostles, okay, if all of this is true and right, everything that you've said about Jesus, that he is Lord, he is King, he is Messiah, if all of that is true and right, I'm wrong. That's where every one of us are today. If everything that is said about Jesus is right, and I have not trusted him, if I do not believe he is the way, the truth, and the life, like he says in John 14, 6, if I don't believe uh, that he is uh, the free gift of God is, is through Jesus Christ our Lord, like if I don't believe all of those things, then I'm wrong. Does that make sense? Because truth is Scripture. And I line up who I am, I line up what I do, and I line up what I think, and I line up what I say. All of those things line up, have to line up, need to begin to come into alignment with who Jesus is, with what the Bible is. And so it even goes back to Romans 10, 9, and 10 that I said last week. um, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, there's a step in the process. But also, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, what did Jesus tell uh, those people that, that they said, we believe in God? Well, he said that even the demons believe, right? And it's more than just believing, man. It's confessing. It's surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. That's what he's asking us to do. And so um, then it goes on even in 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be what? Saved. So if you're here today and you called on the name of the Lord, you you understood who Jesus was and you said, man, I am ready for this in my life. The Bible says, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Not just like, oh man, Lord help me today. No, I'm telling you, like you came to that place where you realized you were in dire straits without Christ in your life and you surrendered your life to him. If you had the cure for COVID, man, I wish I did. If you had the cure for COVID, And it was sitting there, and you had the antidote, you had whatever it would take. You had all of the scientific breakdown. Here's what it would take. If the Lord gave that knowledge to you, 
would you share that with people? Would you? Like at this point in time, with everything that's been going on, like there should be some head nodding, right? Like there should be a yes, Ken, I would do that. If you didn't, you would be the worst person on the planet. I would not want to hang out with you. If that was you and you said, I've got the cure, but I'm not helping any of these suckers, like you're a horrible person. All right, I'm hoping you get COVID. I'm just kidding. That's horrible. But, but I'm sitting there, and I'm questioning you are a horrible, horrible person. But if you had the cure and you began to help it, here's the deal. You hold the cure for what is ailing more people in life than COVID. You hold the cure to it. His name's Jesus His Holy Spirit is inside of you. Do people see it? Do they know it? Do they understand that it's the cure to what's ailing them in their life? Because, man, unless you and I share it, unless you and I are the example to it, they may not ever see it. And they may scratch their head on multiple occasions of what's going on in their lives. And so I just want you to understand, you have inside of you the cure to what's ailing more people in this world than COVID. Sin The effects of sin are killing way more people than COVID. What are you doing to help with that? Are you encouraging people? Man, the people that are hurting the most, are you writing down some of the the, the answers to life's biggest problems that you've learned through Scripture? Are you encouraging people with that? So kids, if you're following along, number one, the good news of Jesus, the gospel, there's that good word, the good news of Jesus is the best news, B-E-S-T news, we can share with any of our friends Cool thing is, kids, he can change the world through you. Some of you, you walk in here and you've got the biggest smiles on the planet. Man, you use that smile and you love your teachers and you love your friends, kids. And I promise you, God can change the world through you. I believe it. I don't care how young you are in here. I don't care how old you are. God can change the world through you. Number two, repentance leads to salvation. I mean, if you've ever heard me talk about repentance, um, I don't know if you've ever gone to a Texas A&M game. I'm not a Texas A&M fan per se or whatever, but if you go and you watch the band for Texas A&M, then you see these guys and they're marching down, they're marching down, and all of a sudden it's like on a dime, they turn. And I don't know how they get uh, their tubas. Uh, they don't call them tubas. I think they call them bass bass horns or something because it's got T-U in it, something crazy like that. But then the, the drums, those big bass drums, like I don't know how, the, when they turn it, I don't know how they don't knock the whole line down, which would be amazing. But, but every time they go down and they turn, that's called a repent. And it's the exact same thing that when you and I came to know the Lord, there, was, there should have been Whether you were at camp, VBS, whatever the case, there should have been a turning in your life. You were headed that way. You were doing your own thing. You were going your own way. You were living in sin. You were doing this, whatever this is, and then you turned. And who you turned to was God. Who you turned to, and because of who you turned to in Jesus, there was a turn. Look at verse 38. Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So he was talking to the one who was the farthest away from God, yet he was also talking to the ones who had just been living inside of religion. Here's my deal. Many of you in this room, you've been living inside of religion, and it's all about do's and don'ts and can'ts and won'ts and shouldn'ts and wouldn'ts, and you forgot. It's all about Jesus. It is all about Jesus. When Jesus is the equation, guess what? There's no need for all of the other religion side of things. He's the one that's going to take you to the next level where you need to be spiritually. Not a list of do's and don'ts and all that other kind of stuff. And look at verse 41. Those who accepted his message, they were what? Baptized. Like that was a great next step in what was happening. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So here's the deal. Repentance. Repentance is all about sanctification. Big word. Just means being set apart. It means that you decided in one moment with the the pounding of the Holy Spirit, maybe the tapping, maybe for some of you got knocked cuckoo crazy for Jesus to finally get in. But repentance is about sanctification, you being set apart, you being different than this world, you caring about what God's word says when most of the world does not. 
That's what repentance is. It's you saying, I am ready to be purified from my sin and to live different than this world does. And then baptism. Baptism is about identification. It's not baptism that saves you. Some of you, you got baptized in front of a group of people and there was no real conversion in your life. You just took a bath in front of a group of people and that's weird. Baptism is all about identification. It's you coming to know Jesus and then you taking a very next and responsible decision to follow him in that. Jesus would never have been baptized if he didn't set the example for us to follow with him. And so some of you here today and you're, you're like, man, can I got baptized before I came to know Jesus. You should get baptized now and now you're able to tell people why you're getting baptized again. I believe it wholeheartedly. Do you have to? No. Would you want to? All that Jesus paid the price for you? I don't know why you wouldn't want to. But baptism is about identifying with Jesus in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. It's you caring deeply about those things of God that, that you said, hey, me being immersed in water. I mean, some people said, man, can I just got sprinkled. You've been around people and you have smelled them at times and you think you should have taken more than just a sprinkle bath. Sprinkling at times does not do the full thing that immersion does. And when you go in, you do a cannonball, you do whatever, man, you go all in. Man, you can't jump into, uh, off a diving board into a pool. You cannot do that without going all in. And I believe it wholeheartedly. Man, you cannot live this Christian life fully and tell everybody about this world uh, that's in this world about who Jesus is unless you go all in. And immersion, you going in, I believe in Jesus, that he lived on this planet, that he was uh, killed on the cross, he was buried in a borrowed tomb, he was underneath that water. That's a whole picture of Jesus. What's about to happen to him 30, uh, whatever, three years later, that he was buried and then he rose to new life. And that's a picture of all of our lives when we go through that. Look at Romans 6, 3 uh, and 4. It says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Man, it's been a hot minute since I've been able to baptize someone. But we always say, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in new life. We said that for every kid that ever got baptized at camp. We've said that for years because we want them to understand, you just set an example for all believers that you believe in your life that Jesus Christ, he was buried, and then he was raised to walk in newness of life. So are you. You don't have to continue in the old pattern, in the old way of living. You have been raised to walk in new life. And so then the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is all about saturation. Some people, many churches around, man, they're waiting for the next big movement of God uh, inside of the Holy Spirit. Man, they're wanting to, to be slain in the Spirit or whatever the case. You got all of the Holy Spirit that you need the day you came to know Jesus Christ. You got it all. You don't have to wait for another. I would love to see another Pentecost. I would love to see another moment where, where thousands of people came to know him, that, that the Holy Spirit showed up in such a way. I would love to see that. But if you're sitting around waiting for more of the Holy Spirit, you don't need any more of the Holy Spirit than you have right now. He's living inside of you. like He's there to guide you. So that Holy Spirit is about saturation. It's about filling up every part of your life, who you date, who you marry, what you say, what comes out of your mouth, your social media platform, all of those things saturated through Jesus Christ, his Holy Spirit. Man, that should be the filter. That should be the, the, the stuff that, that scrubs, like they have air scrubbers in places and it scrubs all of the air before it goes out. Man, that should be the scrubber of every word that comes out of our mouth, every action that happens in our life should be scrubbed completely by the Holy Spirit. He continues to guide us. He never leaves us. And then he sets us with this purpose and he gives us, he empowers us with spiritual gifts. And some of you are like, man, I didn't know I had a spiritual gift. Every one of you inside of this room, if you're a believer in Jesus, you have at least one spiritual gift. You may have more than one spiritual gift, but here's just, just a, a few gifts. I call these kind of the, the team gifts. Why? Because they help support the team. Man, if you look at this, man, you're looking at um, uh, evangelism. You're looking at prophecy, 
teaching, exhortation, shepherding, serving other people, mercy, administration. Like if we didn't have an Ashley, we would be so messed up because her gift of administration for all of the years that I was in Euless as a student pastor, if I wouldn't have had a Heather, her gift of administration, uh, man, we would be so far out of light. But, but this, this gift says, man, I can organize, I can administrate all the details, I can promote stuff, I can lead others well. That's what that gift does. Mercy, identify. I, I don't really have a whole lot of mercy. I should have way more. When people do stupid stuff, I just tend to go, that's stupid. <laughs> and I should probably go, oh, bless their heart. More times than not, I just, that's stupid. I don't have a whole lot of mercy. Uh, I, when I was younger, I had a lot of compassion. When I'd go to a restaurant and I'd see people eating by themselves, I would ask mom and dad, man, can, can that person come and eat with us? But throughout all the years, I'm just like, well, I guess they did something stupid. They're sitting by themselves. I don't know. But, but serving, I love serving. I do. I love serving with people. This past week, we got to do help with the backpack drive stuff at Six Stones. I love to serve. Shepherding, overseeing, training, feeding, leading, great. But sometimes shepherding for me gets hard. Why? Because my mercy at times doesn't show that I'm great at shepherding. And maybe at times you, you've, you've come across a way where I've shepherded and it was kind of, ah, oh, that was harsh. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Hopefully the Holy Spirit kind of healed that moment, right? But if not, we still need to talk <laughs> forgiveness, right? Okay. Um, but teaching, like I love, I love, love, love to, to try my best at making God's word uh, creative and clear, although I don't believe God's word needs to be creative and, and, and any more clear, if that makes sense. I believe you could read God's word on your own. I believe a lot of us fail to do it at times, but I believe God can make his, his word known to you without me being here and teaching this, but prophecy boldly and, and, and fearlessly proclaiming God's truth. I love doing that at times. Um, evangelism, leading others to saving faith in Jesus. Like We have gone far too long across City North, far too long, without seeing somebody come to know the Lord. I feel like that should be something that's happening on the regular. Why? Because there's so many great people in this room, so many amazing people in this room, and I know that you have so much great effect on society and people. Like, let's, let's trust God. Let's at least start asking God, God, give me enough favor to love my neighbors. And let's see what God can do in and through us. But it's been far too long since we've seen a baptism. It's been far too long since we've been able to say, hey, somebody came to know the Lord. And I know COVID's played a huge part in that. I really do. But I think also we love to use COVID as an excuse, right? So you're like, oh, man, now you're stepping on toes. Here's the deal. I heard this great lady one time, and she was coaching she was on the sidelines. She called a timeout, and she called these six young ladies who were on the volleyball court. She called them over, and she said, she just kind of jumped on them really hard, and she just goes, I can't want it for you over here on the sidelines more than the six of you on the court. It's my wife. She was coaching. I can't, as a coach, want it for you more than you want it for yourselves those six of you who've got to get the victory, you've got to come together and you've got to win. Man, I don't even know if she, she realizes just how much that made an impact in my life back in the day of just going, man, like, like even thinking about it from Jesus' perspective, like he can't want it more for us on the sideline or even inside of our hearts, right? Holy Spirit, like the Holy Spirit can't want it more for us than we're willing to go and do it for ourselves. 23 years today, thanks for marrying me, Brooke Wells. I love you. You're awesome. But inside of that, she was right. Like, she could not want it more than those six young ladies out there. She can't. She could go in, uh, even at that point in time in her life, she could have gone in and made a big difference if they would just allow her to play. But as a coach, she couldn't play. Right? The Holy Spirit in our lives, like, he wants it for us. He's empowered us. He's encouraged us. We've given, been given all that we need for life and godliness. And now he's just saying, let's do this. Let's go for it. Let's jump in and let's make this thing happen. And so, um, if you are paying attention, guys, salvation is you saying, kiddos, I want to be on Jesus' team. That's salvation. You're saying, man, I'm ready to, to give my life to Jesus. Baptism is you saying, give me the jersey, I'm ready to play. 
And I've asked kids a lot whenever I'm talking to them about spiritual things. Hey, what, sports, uh, what, what sport event do you like the most? Hey, I like soccer. Hey, I like baseball. Okay, cool. Um, can you just go and walk out on any field at any point in time and just walk out? Hey, throw me the ball. No, like you've got to be a part of the team. And so, so baptism is you saying, give me the jersey, put me in, I'm ready to play. And then the Holy Spirit says, then let me coach you. For those of you who are sports-minded, if you can look at it in that regard, like, like allowing the Holy Spirit to coach you through life, instead of going, man, I know better, I'll pick you up on Sunday, I'll listen to whatever uh, the guy has to say, but, but I got the rest of my life, man, that's not being coached. That's you just doing life without Jesus in your life. And so kiddos, it really is saying, man, I want to give Jesus my life. I want to be on his team. I want to play with him forever. Hey, and then baptism is you saying, hey, give me the jersey. I want to wear it. I want to tell everybody that I'm on his team. I want to tell everybody about who Jesus is. And then it's you being coached the rest of your life to follow him. That's the role. That's how it plays out. Um, so here's the deal. Number three, a New Testament church is an autonomous, big word, SAT word. I learned an SAT word earlier. Who taught me an SAT word? Somebody here this morning, and I've already forgot it. I'm a failure. <laughs> a New Testament church is an autonomous. It means we make our own decisions. There's not somebody somewhere else making our decisions. So Cross City Church, it was an autonomous decision for, for Cross City Church to say, hey, Cross City North is a thing, and let's go do this. I, I question their judgment in saying, can't you go be the guy to campus lead this thing? But, but here's the deal. It was an autonomous decision. Local congregation of baptized believers. Here's the next pieces of it. Unified in faith and called to serve together. Together in fellowship and community. Our one goal. What's our one goal? Jesus. Some of you are like, you're trying to think of, oh, let's make us a long thing. If we could just keep our common goal, Jesus, like we worship Jesus, we love Jesus, and we bring people with us to Jesus, like, like that's pretty simple, right? We're real people. We have real hope, right? Like, and, and then we want to help people live the real life so that other people can come to know who Jesus is. Man, if we make it brain surgery, then I went, here's the deal. I got to go to a church at one point in time. John couldn't go do it, and he said, hey, will you go help lead this church through making some major changes in uh, just their, uh, some of the stuff and how they work together as a staff team? And I'm like, me? Okay. So I get in, I walk into this church, this staff, staff of about seven people, and it was, it was, <laughs> it was a weird grouping of people. Uh, great church in the area, but a weird grouping of people. And so I said, okay, cool, hey, let's start with this. How many of you know your vision statement? Nobody. <laughs> These were staff people. No one on staff could even give off, here's, here's the little. And so I said, okay, cool. Well, let's look at what it is. Like, it was a paragraph. The only person, and he messed it up, was the pastor. He, he almost nailed it, but even he couldn't get it. I was like, so do y'all already see the problem? Like, you don't even know what you're here for. You don't even know what you're doing here as a church. You don't even know why you meet on Sundays. You don't even have a clear understanding of what you're called to do here in this place and what God is calling you to do outside of it. By the time that whole session was over, Saturday from 8 in the morning until about 1 in the afternoon, we changed their mission vision statement. Michael was there with me. We changed their logo. I can't even remember all of the other things that we changed. That church moved locations from where they were to a brand new spot. They're blowing and going now because they finally understood this is how we're wired. This is what we're called to do. And if we just do it and kind of live inside of that, God can do some really cool stuff. If you understand that you're here for Jesus, you go there for Jesus, you work there for Jesus, you are here with your family called to love Jesus, like, if you can just keep the main thing the main thing, man, we, we make life brain surgery. We do, right? Like, some of you are like, not me. <laughs> you're probably the most confused. I love you, but you're probably the most confused. Look at Acts chapter 2. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. All of these things centered around Jesus, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. I mean, they're breaking bread together for Jesus. Who are they talking to when they pray? Jesus, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles who literally 
It was Jesus doing it through the apostles. All the believers, all the believers, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. I told, the, I told several this morning, I'm just going to go and ask Raj. Raj, can we have this huge piece of land that's sitting right here and nothing's on it? What's the worst he can tell me? Exactly. These guys saw the needs. These guys, New Testament, brand new believers, they saw the needs of what was going on in their community. And with Jesus' help, with Jesus' direction, they did what they knew they were supposed to do. So autonomous. As Cross City Church, we make decisions on our own. Uh, uh, the earliest church, they decided, hey, we're going to devote ourselves to these things. As an autonomous church, they decided that fellowship was a big thing. They decided also that they followed in Jesus' footsteps. Baptism was a part. Hence, 3,000 people were baptized and added to their number. Then you look at it, yes, we're autonomous, but then we also work inside of denominations. Some of you, maybe you didn't know that we are part of the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, we, we give to the, uh, to the cooperative program. And so when we give, when you give your, part of your tithing dollars, they go inside of the cooperative program. What does that do? We are one of the largest giving churches inside of the Southern Baptist Convention that then goes and sends people all over the world to what? Share Jesus. It's crazy, right? Like when Jesus is the focus, when Jesus is the reason for us to go on mission trips, every kid that's in here or ever went on a mission trip with us, they understood that our biggest goal there wasn't to make First Baptist Church Euless or Cross City Church famous while we were there. It was about making Jesus known while we were there. Why would we do camp every year? It was to make Jesus known to any of those kids who would show up and needed Jesus in their life. So the uh, Outside of what we do with Cross City, Six Stones is there, yes, to love the community, yes, to help people in need. But the biggest thing, if you were to walk in there and you needed assistance with food or clothes, guess what? Somebody's going to ask you, do you know Jesus? Why? Because it matters. It matters if you know Jesus. If you know Jesus, then you can get through all of the toughest stuff of life. So kids, number three, the church should be the most loving, caring, and giving place to be a part of. It should be. And that's what I hear more times than not when I call people who visit us for the first time. That was the most loving, caring group of people that I've ever engaged on any given Sunday. And so to that, I just say, let's keep doing that. Can we continue to be that? Because to me, when you do that, when you're those things, you're being Jesus to everybody that comes in. For our participation in the church now should be as big of a priority as it was then. In the Wells family, we understand fully all of the things that are out there that distract us. We do. We, we understand things that, that at times rob us uh, of being together at church and stuff like that. Our kids are highly involved in sports, always have been, um, and for as long as I know, probably will be. And so we can't use that as an excuse to not be close to God. And we can't use that always as an excuse to not be there because we're tired uh, from whatever on the weekend. Like if, if, we don't, if we're not playing on Sunday or if we're not out of town, we're here. It's a priority. We, we care deeply about church. But we also know that there are a lot of things that are out there. Uh, man, I would never tell somebody uh, to not go on vacation because you've got to be at church. I would never tell anybody that. Never. Like, you need vacation. You need time with your family. So, but I just want you to always make church a priority. Make the things of church a priority. If you don't do it here, make church happen at your house. Make it a priority because it matters. It matters to your kids. It says this in 46. Every day they continue to meet together. Did you hear that? Every day. What? Church every day? Oh, my God. Every day. They made it that much of a priority. Every day they would meet together. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. I don't know if I told Brooke that uh, our small group was coming over every day. I don't know if she would be stoked on that. I don't know that I would be either because then I got to clean the house every day. We got to work hard to do that. But these people saw that it was such a priority. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily. There was something that was changed about them. There was something that was different. They went against their culture they did something different, and Jesus was the reason for all of that to happen. How did it look for them? Man, it looked like it was a priority, and it looked like it was a passion. Does church, to your kids, to your people that you live around, do they see that church is a priority, and do they see that church is a passion? Do they see that Jesus 
is the reason why you do all the stuff that you do. Every day, not just Sundays, multiple places, the temple courts and in the homes. Man, they made church a priority. What are all the things that take priority over church in our lives? If you know right now, these are the things that are the most, the biggest things in our family's life that are uh, things that lead us away on Sundays or things, whatever these things are, list them out. And as often as you can to combat those, fix it. And when you can't fix it, embrace it and make church happen anyway, wherever you're at. Um, Definition of priority, being of the highest of importance in rank. Highest of importance in rank. It was so funny. One day uh, in our first student ministry, we were doing a big series on inviting friends and, and all that kind of stuff. And I remember somebody, one of these girls asked Brooke and just said, hey, when's Ken going to quit talking about bringing your friends and the importance of church? And I remember Brooke just saying, maybe when you do it. So sometimes just an honest answer, it really is. Like, it just, it matters. It matters. It matters for us not to just stay us four and no more. Like, to see growth. Like, the times that I can remember in student ministry when we were thriving, growing, when we were seeing even uh, 600 on Wednesday nights, it was because there were a couple of, of our classes inside of our student ministry that cared deeply about their friends. And they wanted to see change happen in their school. And they wanted to see change happen in their homes because they were going through crazy stuff at home. And so the one place that they knew they could bring them to wasn't maybe just their house at times when they would feed their friends or whatever. But the place that they knew where they had seen life change and life change happen regularly was at church. Which should be a great place for that to happen. That's why I was, even this year, just I was... Uh, sad that, that COVID was here and, and, and camp, just because I've seen life change happen so much at camp. But I hope that you as a church, that you would crave to see life change happen. I, I think there's a, a, an opportunity every Sunday for life change to happen, even inside of me, even as I teach God's word, like even preparing. I was able to tell somebody last week, like more times than not, I'm up here and I'm preaching to myself more than I'm preaching or talking to anybody else out there. And there's days and moments and times in prepping where I'm like, man, I've never understood it that way. May God help me to help others understand it better. That's our goal, right? We're all in this together. And so, uh, kids, if you're filling in, fight hard in your life to make church a top priority. If you don't fight hard for it, guess what? It'll never become one. If it's just something, my mom used to say, when I was going into into church work, my mom would say, early on, she goes, can't remember that 90% of people look at church as an elective course and not a requirement. And what I've seen throughout most of the years, when I see families who see church as an elective course and not a requirement, their homes look like it too. Their relationships look like it too. The church should be there to undergird and to help come along and to help grow us up and to be that encouragement when, when things begin to chip away at the fiber of relationships inside of marriages and families like the church should come alongside and to help and speak into it. It really does matter making those things of highest importance. Look at Acts twenty twenty eight. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he, brought, uh, which he bought with his own blood. And so, uh, and you're sitting there, why should church have a high priority in my life? And this is really the answer that I've given to so many people. And it's an answer that Perry Noble used to give so often as a pastor. But it says this, it's what Jesus devoted his whole life to, the church. You think about it. 33 years on the planet, those last three, public ministry, he devoted his whole life to the church. And what Jesus, also what Jesus was willing to give his whole life up for, he died for the church. He died for you individually, church universal, but he died so that you and I would be able to have this great opportunity, so the early church would have that, Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider how we may what spur one another on to love and to good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Here's the deal. The day's approaching. Jesus is coming back. And if they believe Jesus was coming back then, right, we've got to be way closer to it now. And the signs all around us in this world, like, like we need to be ready for when that day comes. So kids, number five, the ultimate goal of every believer is to love people and to lead them to Jesus. The church should be a great place for that to happen in. 
So if you're here today and you're sitting there going, man, what in the world? Where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? The world has yet to see what God can do through one church that is completely surrendered and sold out. I used to say that to teenagers all the time, that God has, the world has yet to see what God can do through one teenager completely surrendered. But I think the world has yet to see what God can do through one church completely sold out and surrendered. And I would love to be a part of what was happening in Acts. Would you? And wouldn't you love to have been able to be a part of that and to see all that God was doing? So the ultimate goal of every believer is to love and lead people, kids. If you can remember that with your life, no matter if you're uh, dancing, uh, man, you can tell people through dance how much Jesus loves them. If you're playing football, like there are so many avenues by which we can do all of those things. And I guess my question to you is, what do we have to fear? People? Pandemic? Popularity? Like at the end of the day, do those things really, are those things really game enders for being the example that we need to be to other people? So uh, today with heads bowed and eyes closed, I just ask you the question. Maybe some of you, you're sitting there, you're going, man, uh, I believe like you do guys here, like you guys here as a church. I want to be a part of this. We'd love to have you. Man, we would love to have you. We would love for you to, to be a part of our family. And so for us, those, those things are very important that you would come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. But also, if you've never followed through in that next step of believer's baptism, that is a great way to join. Maybe you've been a part of another church at some point in time and you were baptized there. Uh, a simple transfer of letter or just coming on statement of faith. Whatever the case may be, we would love for you to jump in and to begin to row in the same direction as us. And so we really have, we've had about five weeks, we'll have about six weeks by the time all of this is over to make this pretty much our next step class. So if you're sitting there and you're going, man, I want to jump in, I want to be a part of this, I would love to allow this to be the place where I come in and I begin to, to just do the work of loving people to Jesus. I just want you to know, you are welcome here. We would love for you to come and be a part of that. But it may be that you're here today and you would say, man, Kent, there's so much that's still on the table in my life. There's so many things I still have questions to. There's so many things. I, I still don't know that I'm ready to trust Jesus. Man, this Jesus that we talk about. Matthew chapter 28 said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he says to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So if you're here today, you are part of our going. You're part of, of Cross City Church. And we'd love to tell you that Jesus Christ, he came, he lived, and then he died for you and for me. He died so that you and I could have complete access to God, our Father. Like he did all of this so that you and I would be able to have church here today. And behold, I'm with you always, always. That's the beauty of what most people that don't have Jesus in their life, they're missing the always of Jesus. And if you want Jesus with you always, anytime, forever, man, it comes when you surrender your life to him. And so if you're here today and you would say, man, today's the day. I'm ready to nail that down. Man, I'd love to talk to you about it. As you go out these doors, there's also a, a decision station that's out there. We'd love to give you a Bible, love to answer your questions. Rosemary and her team, they're always so faithful to be a part of that out there. And so um, please don't walk out. If you walk out of here and you still have questions, I'm not saying I have all the answers. I'm saying I will help you. If I don't know the answer to your question, I promise you I will help find that answer. But at the end of the day, all of us need what everyone else in this room has. We all need the Jesus. We all need to know that we've all got each other's backs. We all need to know that we're a church and we are all rowing in the same direction. And that is to Jesus. So if you're here today and you would say, I'm ready to do that, let's talk. If you're here today and you would say, man, I don't know what all this next week brings. Hey, will you just pray for me? I promise you let me know. I can let everybody else in this room pray and I will send them a text and we will pray for you this week, all right? Let's pray. God, thank you so very much. Thank you for the way that you love us. God, for the, the ones who are here today who've never come to that saving knowledge and that understanding of what Jesus did for us all of those years ago. And I pray that today would be their day of salvation. I pray that they would understand that we, in that moment, that we get set apart from this world and that we continue to, to live in this world and we continue to point people to who you are, I just pray that you would remind us all this week that you were there, that you will always, always 
be there inside of us, cheering us on, uh, holding our hand to get us to the next place, pushing us along in those moments when we want to give up. Thank you that your Holy Spirit has all of the same power still today as it did when it raised you, Jesus, from the grave. We get to live in that same kind of power. Help us to live in that this week. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for all that we get to do inside of this place that we call Cross City North. We love you. We're forever indebted to you for what you allow us to do each and every day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.